So Revelation 3.20 says this. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. One of Jesus' statements um, in the book of Revelation. Now, I love Bible study. Um, not just because we get to get into the Word, but it's the actual, the idea of fellowshipping with your friends, right? Getting together. Um, and I'm pretty sure you feel the same way as me. Uh, I love sharing with my friends in the group. I enjoy their presence, uh, the shared love for the Word, and also their friendship. I enjoy, I enjoy the food we eat. Uh, and it's a very, uh, I think, distinctly Filipino thing, just to gather for the food. Um, I love hosting, and I really enjoy joking around, making my friends laugh, making them think. And I appreciate their honesty, and I'm also humbled by the privilege of speaking truth to them. My spirit is lifted when I fellowship, and I'm encouraged when I hang out with my Christian friends. Like I said, I, I think that you probably echo those sentiments, right? So far in our study, we have emphasized the fact that the New Testament uh, concept of fellowship is way more than just social activity. What I've just described to you sounds like social activity, right? Um, but the emphasis always, practically every time we gather and study this, is that fellowship is just way more than that. But that doesn't mean that we can't gather and have fun. Uh, fellowship includes social activity. It cannot be divorced. We don't have a social element, right, when you have Bible study. And our study today is just going to focus on that idea. Because um, studying this book, you do get the sense that Jerry Bridges, you know, he always tries to say, guys, it's more than just gathering. It's true, uh, deep spiritual fellowship is more than just seeing your buddies and talking about Jesus. It's way deeper than that. But he tries to balance it at the end because we don't want to be in a space in our heads where we think, you know, you've got to separate the social part of it. It actually has a very, very uh, relevant and strong part uh, of fellowship, the social element. But we'll get to that. Koinonia, right? That's the word we've been studying. That was used in the New Testament. Um, in the New Testament times to describe how ordinary people get together in an ordinary social interaction. Koinonia. If you were in Bible days before the New Testament was written, that's what it describes, gathering together. But as with a lot of Greek terms, the, the New Testament writers would take a term and they would give it deeper uh, spiritual significance. Right? Because obviously Christ had birthed the church and as they were describing the church, uh, words uh, took on new meaning. And koinonia is one of those words where it became more than just social gathering. It became what we now understand to be true, spiritual, deep fellowship. Fellowship that happens when we're connected to God and connected to each other. Um, but like I said, we must not think that fellowship is just this somber gathering where... You know, there's no, Walana Kwentohan is just like, let's just talk about the word and, you know, let's just be careful not to talk about the weather and all that stuff. And um, that's not what it is at all, of course. Um, we are created by God to be social beings. Lahatayo, all of us here, is a social creature. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're created for relationships. Uh, and that's why, you know, we're encouraged to get married, we're encouraged to have friends. Um, and the, the concept of the loner, that's not something we, we all relate to or even like. Right? But you go to church and you see someone who's alone, your heart kind of goes out to that person, right? Or even in the workplace, and he's just sitting alone, obviously you feel for that person. And I think it's fair to say all of us would maybe make some kind of effort to reach out to the person. Right? Because we understand that being alone, is not, that's not normal. It's not... It's not natural for us. And uh, this whole idea of being alone in the world, uh, what is the saying? No man is an island, right? It's a very old saying, but it's true. We're not isolated. We can't exist in isolation. Because God hasn't designed us that way. 
And um, the problem when it comes to modern fellowship is when we, uh, that's all we live for, the, just the social uh, dimension. If you go to a Bible study, all you really are looking forward to is the gathering, and then when you start to open the Bible and start studying, you're kind of like, ah, okay, when you kind of switch off or you're not that serious, that's the problem. And a lot of Christians do that. A lot of Christians are not actually excited to get into the Word. They're not actually excited so much to share or see how they can impact or make a difference in another believer's life. They're more interested in just the gathering part. And that's what we need to be careful about. Um, we need to balance the social dimension of fellowship with the building up of one another in Jesus. That the type of truth, witnessing, uh, and sharing that comes with true fellowship. Now, if you think about the church on Pentecost, if you go all the way back to when the, the church was born in, in the book of Acts, right? What does it say? The people devoted themselves not only to the teaching of the apostles, uh, to prayer, and to fellowship, but also to the breaking of bread. What does that mean? Could it mean the Lord's Supper? Possibly. But I believe that it also means literally they had meals together. They broke bread. They ate together. In fact, Acts 2, 46 to 47 states, They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. This is a very heartwarming statement. I love this statement, actually. Because the first Christians ate together. They ate together. They praised together, the Bible says. And they enjoyed the favor of the people. Meaning that their fellowship had some kind of effect on the people around them. Right? Fellowshipping together, eating together, praising God together. Imagine the purity of that initial church. There's no denominational line. There's no, you know what I mean? confession of faith and all that stuff. And I'm not saying those are bad things. Those are very good things. I'm just saying that the early church in its purest form was just about let's gather, let's devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, let's break bread, let's eat together, let's enjoy each other's company, let's praise God together. And what that had, the effect that had on the immediate community was that the people favored them. The people found something good about their fellowship, about their gathering, which is pretty amazing. Now, go back further and think about the Lord Jesus himself. And, you know, pre-church, and you see the behavior of Jesus, you see that he was a social being. Obviously, right? Because if God made us to be social beings, then the Lord Jesus himself would be the ultimate example of that. And just reading through all the Gospels, you'll see many occasions where Jesus would share a meal, uh, he would attend feasts and weddings, right? That was his thing. Um, where was his first miracle? What was his first miracle? Wedding. 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 Exactly. Turning water into wine. Uh, he was at a wedding, a gathering, a celebration. Um, you know, his wonderful parable about the prodigal son. We all know the story. How does it end? What does the father exclaim at the end when the son has returned? He says in Luke 15, 23, let's have a feast and celebrate. You know, the return of your son, how do you celebrate it? Today it might be, I don't know, I'll buy you a car or something, right? But in the, back in the day, it's just, it's cause for celebration. Let's invite everyone, let's have a great meal, let's fill ourselves, let's be satisfied because because the son has returned. Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. We know that's not true. But why did people say that? Because he was always out eating and drinking and, and being with people, being around people, sharing a meal. People would invite him in. He'd be like, sure, I'll, I'll drop by, let's eat. Um, uh, Zacchaeus, right? His uh, wonderful transformation. Jesus went up to him and said, hey, uh, I've got an appointment with you. I'm going to visit your house, right? Social interaction. They had dinner, and that's where Zacchaeus announced, I'm giving back my money. Right? All those people have cheated. That was an announcement over a meal. 
You look at the Pharisees, they were always contrasted by, they wanted the best seat in the house, right? Um, but the fact remains, social gatherings were very important, and Jesus himself understood that they are occasions to be enjoyed, participated in, and encouraged. Social activity, at the end of the day, should glorify God. Uh, like everything we do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, interesting choice of words, right? Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, in other words, it, parang, that's the, the one thing that people can relate to, eating and drinking. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. That is a simple but effective way to guide us in our fellowship activities. So whatever shape or form your Bible study takes, or maybe you've got a, a youth ministry or a campus ministry or a prison ministry, I don't know what kind of ministries you guys are involved in, but whatever shape or form, one way to guide us in pursuing these ministries is to be reminded that whatever we do, we just have to do it for the glory of God. And it's very, very straightforward. In other words, how do you conduct your social gatherings? By remembering to thread them with the love and truth of Jesus. Um, I think it's important to say that to, as a reminder because sometimes we do go to a Bible study and we kind of go through the motions and maybe forget why we're actually there. And we get to the Bible when the part where we do open the Bible is great, but the parts around that, you know, sometimes it's just we don't really think too much about it. Gwentohan, study, taposna. Is there more to it than that, is what I'm saying. The social element is great. Gathering is fine. But how do we maximize that, that fellowship opportunity, right? So in short, we need to create connections. Um, we need to connect our social gatherings to the truth. Um, so for example, if you're gathering, uh, some of you are fairly active. I'm not one of those people who plays basketball. I don't know. If you do, but sometimes the, the, so the village, they gather and they play basketball, Sina Peter, Martin, and, and, and younger people, I don't know who actually goes, I don't play, but they gather, right, and they, they, they play basketball. That's a form of fellowship. I don't know if they do a devotional or if they tie it together with something, but if that's something you do, then a, a nice way to maybe open that would be to have a quick devotional. I know that some people do that, and they say, guys, remember why we strive, right? Um, uh, the physical activity, what did Paul say? Uh, uh, physical exercise is good for the body, but you know, spiritual things are even more important. So that's an opportunity to talk truth into the lives of your, your people. Um, Christmas parties. Right? We do Christmas parties as a church, and we gather, we fellowship, but we always make sure that it's grounded in the truth. That's another great way of tying it all together, talking about Jesus' first coming. Um, and there are many, many different... Uh, other ways. Uh, e even, you know, I have a Bible study that's uh, mostly single people. We do have a married couple now. But the dimension before was to always conduct the Bible study knowing that everyone's single. And when you view it through that lens, how do you maximize your time as a single person pursuing your first love, Jesus Christ? So that colors the conversation, right? If you remember these things, or maybe you handle a married couple Bible study. Well, obviously you're going to look at it through a different lens, but still through the lens of how do we serve Jesus Christ together, right? Uh, what I'm saying is that our, our Bible studies, our gatherings should always have that thread of truth, that spiritual dimension that affects the entire study, not just the content, but when you actually gather, you're, you're acting and moving among your people, thinking of how the truth should impact the entirety of your, your gathering. Um, in other words, let's not squander these occasions to make the most of God and bring his truth to others. If you read about Jesus, again, you know, he was a master, right, at, at social interactions. Whoever he met, he would speak truth to. And Jesus being Jesus often had some kind of miracle involved, you know, healing or some kind of amazing display of divine power. Um, and of course, being the son of God, he had the amazing ability of communication. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't try to do the same. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't approach someone and speak truth to their lives uh, the way that Jesus would. 
We are his ambassadors, and we can also emulate his passion for, for sharing God's word to, to those that we meet, especially in our Bible studies. Um, when we gather, we'll talk about anything, right? Um, movies, music, whatever it is, politics perhaps, chit-chat. That's okay. But again, let's not just make it about that. Let's try and thread God into that conversation. Sayang kasi, if you just meet and gather, and that's all you talk about, and the God element's not there, right? In fact, it would be kind of sad if you gathered for two hours, spent 30 minutes on the Word, and the rest was like about everything else. Again, nothing inherently sinful, but a major saying opportunity where you can just you can add God into that conversation. I'm saying this, and I realize it's not as easy as it sounds, because sometimes when you gather, you just, you know, you talk, you, it's natural, right? And it kind of feels a bit artificial, kapag, I don't know, when you're talking and you try to bring some doctrine into it, but I'm weird about it. Like, you've got to find that opening, and it's got to be natural, it has to be organic. But there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. Um, for example, you can just lead with the question, what has the Lord been teaching you lately? That's a very simple but effective way of opening up a spiritual conversation. Uh, you could be talking to someone about the latest movie that just came out, if you're a movie buff, whatever. And then at some point say, hey, I want to ask you a question. How has God been talking to you lately? How has, how has he been moving in your life? Great question, and it opens up the door immediately, right, to talk about spiritual things. So hindi na sayang yung moment. Um... So questions like that, which leads me to this next question. How do we improve our gatherings? Right? If that's one way to improve it, how else can we improve our other gatherings? How can we transform, and not just Bible studies, okay? I'm talking about like when you're in church. You know after church, when we all walk outside and we all sort of gather at the entrance and say hello, hi, hello, and everyone catches up, right? It's a great moment of... Uh, of, of um, uh, Fellowship, that is fellowship. But quite often, again, it's just chat, chit chat, catch up. Oh, come on, I haven't seen you like in a couple of weeks. Oh, what's going on? How do we improve that? How do we find a, find a way to thread God back into those conversations? How do we use the welcome booth in our church to stimulate others in their spiritual lives? You know, Jerry Bridges, he provides a simple way to think about fellowship as a means, sorry, social fellowship as a means to reach spiritual fellowship. And I like his illustration. Imagine uh, a series of circles, concentric circles, so small and then bigger and then bigger and then bigger, right? He describes it this way. The first circle is you in the middle. That's you. Who you are, who you really are. Everything about you, everything that's true about you. That's you in the center. And the next circle represents your bosom friend. You remember that? We talked about the bosom buddy, right? Someone who's so close to you, you can tell practically everything. You can be very intimate and honest with. That's the next person in, your, in, next, uh, in, in the circle of, um, I don't know what you call that, influence perhaps. And then the next circle represents those few other believers with whom you have a fairly deep communion or spiritual fellowship. So this would be your, your closest, I guess, circle of spiritual friends who you share deeply, you, you both, you all pretty much agree doctrinally, um, you share the same pursuits, you listen to the same podcasts perhaps, but deep young fellowship, right? But it's beyond the bosom buddy level. Uh, bosom buddy is, is the closer level, this would be a slightly less intimate level, but still deep. And then the next level is those Christians in your church or your campus discipleship group with whom you have a group relationship. And Jerry Bridges says this relationship is a mixture of social and spiritual activities. That's the kind of fellowship that we experience in church. Because we're not close with everyone in church. We don't share all the same beliefs, perhaps. Um, we know each other. We know something about the family or their work or something, but we don't really gather every week, right? But that is the body of Christ. That is what characterizes, and we are uh, all related spiritually 
and we do have a duty to fellowship with each other and we get to fellowship with each other every Sunday, especially after church when we come out of church. That's the fellowship we should actually really be thinking about. Obviously, you, your Bible study, your close Bible study, your close buddies, okay lang yan. And you probably to, do talk about Jesus and the Word, right? But what about that outer fellowship where, where we gather on a Sunday and we see each other? What are we doing to improve those moments of fellowship? What are we doing to thread Jesus back into those conversations? We need to work on that. And the way to work on that is not from the inside outwards. It's the outwards, inwards approach. You, you meet people in that circle, that outer circle, and you try to find openings, and you, you build up that social gathering, and then, and then you work your way in. In other words, you might see someone in church who you know, you don't really share much fellowship with, but you can begin to talk with them. That's a social interaction. And the more you talk and see each other every Sunday, it gets to a point where you can work your way in, and they might become uh, more intimate with you, uh, and it might get even, even deeper until they become something truly close to you. It doesn't always happen that way, but you have to work on the outside towards the inward. Um, again, to quote Jerry Bridges, we, we cannot develop a spiritual I intimacy with another believer until we have first had communion or spiritual fellowship with him. And we cannot develop a communion until we have first developed a social relationship. That's why the social dimension always provides the larger context in which spiritual fellowship and one-to-one -one intimacy are developed. So again, just to illustrate this, if you just walk up to someone after church, someone you know but you're not really close with, and you just ask them, you know, how, what is the Lord teaching you in your life? I'd be like, okay. It's a little awkward. It doesn't really work that way, right? You wouldn't do that, clearly. But you could if you have a social relationship with that person. If after every Sunday you've been talking, genuinely getting to know the person, and then after, we say, a couple of weeks, may, I don't know, may goodwill, about you've built something, and when you pop that question, it's fine. The person will react, you know what, dude? You know, we've been talking for a while, and yeah, I feel like the Lord is speaking to me, and it just opens up something. So again, work your way from the outside towards the inside, but it has to all begin with that social interaction. It cannot be divorced. You can't just hardcore just go up to someone and like, <laughs> you know, dive into their deep spiritual life, you know, up on connection, up on common ground. Of course, we can't do that with every single person in church. That's impossible. We don't have the capacity as human beings to sustain a very deep, meaningful relationship with absolutely everyone. And if you look at Jesus, even he had levels within his uh, the way he dealt with, the, with his disciples, for example. Twelve disciples, but he had an inner circle. And within that inner circle, there was an even smaller circle. You remember that study? Um, so, you know, Jesus understood the importance of fellowship with everyone, discipling everyone, but also having a deeper relationship with others, and perhaps an even deeper relationship with a chosen few. There's nothing sinful in that. That's just the way it is as human beings. Otherwise, you'll... you'll <laughs> you'll quickly, you'll just burn out. There's no way you could do it. Um, it's very difficult. Especially when you handle people who, who have problems, who have struggles, and they come to you, it requires energy, especially on a deeper level. Imagine 100 people all coming to you <laughs> with their deep, intensely personal, spiritual problems. Um, no one could do it. So that's not the, the goal. It's not to have the deep relationship with every single person. But it is to thread Jesus Christ back into our conversations, to allow the Spirit to, to open up those, those relationships He has deemed are for us, right? Now, that is why the social aspect of fellowship is important. I began this by saying, like, you know, we often think that the social element is something to be set aside, we've got to be focused on the Word and God and make it all serious. But no, the point is, it is a vital aspect of fellowship, the social element. It's a means to enjoy each other, but it's also a gateway to deeper fellowship. So we just have to balance it, right? Not neglect it, but recognize that it's, it's crucial to true biblical fellowship. In fact, some people, and perhaps 
some of you here are like this, we almost have a gifting for, for facilitating fellowship. You know the Ernie's and the Ian's of the world who gather and they facilitate and they, they do that stuff. They seem to have a gift and maybe it's um, the gift of hospitality or service, right? But some of us have that unique gift where we like to host. We like to, to have people over. We like to be able to, to bring people together and talk about the word. Not everyone has that knack. Um, but whether you have that knack or, or not doesn't matter. We need to recognize and support the idea of social, uh, spiritual fellowship. I began with a verse from Revelation. And Jesus was talking to his church at Laodicea. And he invited them to have fellowship with them. I'll read it again, Revelation 3.20. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus Christ is talking about having a social interaction with someone. And if you break it down, um, in first century culture, to have a meal with someone meant to have a, a, a deeper sort of relationship. Okay? I think in the West, that's not really, doesn't have that meaning anymore. You might have a meal with someone, but it's just purely a social thing. Uh, you know, you meet at a restaurant for a meeting or let's just have dinner. Um, but in the first century culture, it was different. It had deeper significance. Uh, maybe in the Philippines, you know, we can still relate to that. I said earlier, we, we do like to eat. We're a nation of people who like to gather and eat. Um, the whole concept of um, seeing someone and saying, even if it's a complete stranger, we, 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 we're, we're opening that moment because we understand that that moment can be actually something, right? It can be precious. I can share this with you, and if you agree to eat with me, great. I might not ever see you again, but I've opened that door of hospitality, and it could be a good moment, right? We understand that. But what Jesus was doing here is saying, look, because the church he was speaking to, they were all backsliders. They had forsaken Jesus. And he's saying, guys, if you repent, I stand here, I'm knocking at the door. If you repent, I will come in and we will have fellowship. We will have deep spiritual fellowship. And to get his point across, he used that very basic, universally understood social interaction of eating, eating together. I will come in, <coughs> excuse me, I will come in and I will eat with you and you with me. What it means is simply this. Jesus used that symbol because that symbol is a truth. When we eat together, when we fellowship together, when we socially interact, that's a gateway to fellowship. It is a, it is a way to move into deeper spiritual fellowship or a deeper relationship. Uh, Jesus is giving, uh, he is highlighting the importance of being able to gather and fellowship with another human being. Okay? So, it's not divorced, it's biblical, uh, and it is relevant. Today we have gathered. This is a social gathering. We have eaten together. Praise God for our twice a month guaranteed McDonald's breakfast, right? And I look forward to that. I love McDonald's. But obviously I know that it's way beyond that. We can't just live for that stuff. It doesn't make sense to just live for it. It also doesn't make sense to cut it out completely. Imagine coming here, but there's no food. It's kind of like, it's early in the morning. These are all, these are natural. God has ordained this. We are to enjoy it. But we are to bring it to the next level in terms of our using it as a gateway to, to reaching out on a spiritual level to each other. I just want to say this final word. We've looked at this series, and we've had you know, different facets of biblical fellowship. We've deepened our understanding of what it means to be in true spiritual fellowship from being united with God, connected with Him, to being connected with each, with each other, um, to, you know, sharing our possessions and, and really going deep in what it means to be in fellowship with one another. How do we tie it all together? Because certainly when you leave today and you carry on with your lives, we're not going to be thinking, about this responsibility and then this thing about fellowship. 
that's not it. What it is is understanding there's a thread that ties all of this together. And if, if we understand this thread, this basic principle, true biblical fellowship, well, it'll happen. And that's this, Romans 15, 5. In Christ, each member belongs to all the others. In Christ, each member belongs to all the others. Jerry Bridges says this, I belong to you and you belong to me. And we each belong to and have ownership, quote unquote, in every other believer in the world. This mutual belonging to one another is the thread that ties together all the seemingly diverse elements of fellowship. Uh, I don't think we can go around thinking constantly about all the spiritual dimensions of, of true fellowship and all the, the ways that we can affect each other. I mean, that's, you know, let's be reasonable, Deba. Um, but the way to, to think about it, to have the mindset of true spiritual fellowship, is to remember that I am yours and you are mine. We are the body of Christ. And, and we, just, we just share by virtue of being in the body of Christ. That's what it means to have true spiritual fellowship. If we just remember that, that we belong to each other, that we benefit each other in Jesus, then I think we will share. We will love one another. We will pray for one another. We will serve one another. The moment we stop thinking and we, the moment we fail to remember that I belong to you and you belong to me and we belong to each other in the body of Christ, then that's when we... we, we our, our muscles atrophy and we don't serve. We don't remember to, to love one another. We don't share. And then we start to become isolated. Because we're all like, well, I'm living for myself. I'm going to church. I'm doing my thing. But that is not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is all about sharing. It's all about living and being for one another. Everything we've learned about true fellowship is rooted in the concept that we belong to one another. We belong to one another. Koinonia is therefore not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's the idea that we belong to one another. And we can express the different dimensions of spiritual fellowship in all the riches of what it means to be in true fellowship. The more we recognize this, and the more we let it inform our fellowship, we will become more like the first century church. I think that's an aim we can all agree, or an aspiration we can all agree to, to look towards. How can we be more like the first century church? Because that was, again, as I mentioned, the purest version of the church, right? The, the, the church, in, without the baggage, it was simple. It was, it was what Christ intended for us to be. And if we, if we give ourselves to each other, if we understand that we live and belong to each other in Jesus, then we would devote ourselves to fellowship. Just as it says in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. It's one thing to want the fellowship. It's one thing to say, I believe in fellowship. It's one thing to preach and teach that fellowship is true and real. But to devote yourself to fellowship is an entirely different thing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father, for this series of lessons in true spiritual fellowship. Um, it's pretty amazing, Lord, that the concept of fellowship has all these different dimensions and it's really rich. And we've learned a lot, Lord. Um, at the same time, it's a lot to take in and remember. Um, there are certain attitudes we need to to have. Uh, there are certain changes in thinking and behavior we, that need to happen in our own lives, Lord, for us to truly experience and perpetuate, Lord, uh, true spiritual fellowship, the real biblical koinonia. Um, but Lord, I pray that you work in all of us to help us remember what it is to truly fellowship and that is by remembering that we live for one another, that we are and belong to one another in you, in your body. I pray, Lord, that that's something that we would carry with us, 
something that we'd remember every time we gather for a Bible study, uh, a spiritual gathering, um, church, before and after church, as we walk out those doors, um, special occasions like Christmas parties and gatherings. I pray, Lord, that we would remember that we belong to each other and that out of that we could remember to interact with each other and bring you into the conversation and to build those social connections, Lord, so that they would lead to deeper connections. I pray, Lord, that that would be true of each of us so that really we could live in a way that is closer to what the first century look, church looked like, where they devoted themselves to fellowship, they broke bread with one another, they praised you with each other and found favor with the communities around them. Thank you, Father. I pray that you bless our time of discussion as the groups divide and uh, speak to us, Lord. Use us to build each other up in true fellowship. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.